Hey folks, welcome back to the Unbeatable Mind podcast. My name is Mark Devine, super stoked to have you here today. As you know, I know that you have a lot going on, a lot vying for your attention, and the selection of this podcast was one of 10 million things you could have chosen to do differently. So I don't take that lightly, I appreciate it. Um, my guest today, Willie Banks, is an extremely interesting individual. <laughs> We're going to have a fun conversation, Willie. Thanks for being here. Before I give you a little bit more detail or probably let Willie tell us about himself in his own words, um, I want to enlist your help for our Burpees for Vets Challenge. We, um, last December, I'll tell the story to Willie. Last December, I challenged myself to do 200 burpees a day just for fun. And it was a blast. Wow. Right? Yeah. And at the end of the uh, month, I was like, I don't really want to stop. And so I, I was like, had this really weird flash of inspiration that I wanted to do something with a team, something bigger. And I had started the, this um, foundation a couple of years earlier called the Courage Foundation, which is to help veterans with post-traumatic stress. Fantastic. And I um, also had learned through that process that 22 vets a day with post-traumatic stress are committing suicide. And so I thought, what can we do about that? You know, I can't, yeah. I felt so powerless about yeah. that. And I have from friends, and I had a client who also was a victim of that. And so that number 22 popped in my head and burpees, and they combined. And out of that came this challenge for me to put out to my tribe to do 22 million burpees this year. Oh. I know, right? Oh, my and that's God. what they all said. It was like, oh, are you serious? And then they said, I said, well, okay, I, I can't do this alone. I'll do 100,000. That means I need 219 other people to either do a hundred thousand or let's figure it out and so i've got so far we're up to about 11 million burpees wow i'm at Amazing. eighty thousand on my own chunk i chunked it out into 300 a day and i just it's a non-negotiable right because of that commitment to that why absolutely and at any rate the whole point is we're going to raise awareness and money and we're doing that that's why i keep harping on it uh, we're raising two hundred fifty thousand dollars. That's our minimum goal. We're at two hundred. Wow. We have four months left. Fabulous. We're going to use those funds to directly support vets who are suffering by putting them through the type of training that we know will help them. You know what I mean? Mindfulness, yeah. breath work, yoga, yeah. Yeah. and then giving them a, uh, a certified mentor who can work with them over the long haul through their real pits where they get stuck, that's and that's great. when they that's when they're most at risk. That's amazing. Isn't that cool? So burpeesforvets.com is the website for this challenge. The foundation is called the Courage Foundation. Their website is feedcourage.org. Uh, I'm on the board of the foundation. I don't have anything to do with running it anymore. But um, I certainly want to be involved in these big challenges every year. Well, that's amazing. My father was a Marine. Was he? And he Semper Fi. Yeah, Semper Pops. Fi. And he treated us like his, uh, you know, his soldiers. His cadets. <laughs> yeah, bouncing quarters off our beds and, you know, make it up again, you know. But um, I really respected what he did. He gave me the, the dignity, the, the, um, the, the training. Yeah. And the forthwith to, to become a, an athlete. For sure. Yeah. And the discipline to become an athlete. You were, so so just, when he passed away, sorry. Uh, when he passed away, I took it upon myself to really, you know, to, to believe in what he said and took it upon myself to study the, the things and, and, and learn about how I can right. help veterans. And um, so I didn't do your challenge because that sounds like an insane thing to do. <laughs> of course. But I, I the, did the, the challenge. Done. I took the 22 for 22 day challenge of doing push ups. Oh, cool. Yeah. So okay. I did that and I filmed yeah. it all and it's all right. online. But I, I, I you. praise you for what you've done for veterans and what you continue to do for veterans and yeah. much appreciated on well, behalf they, of they my need, family. I appreciate that big time. And I know your dad is up there going, hoo ya or <laughs> oorah yes. is what Ooh-rah. the Marines would say. They, um, it, you know, it's, it's not too much to suffer a little bit for people who suffered and served so boldly for us. You know what I mean? Yeah, God bless you. I hear that. So, Willie, you are an Olympian you're heavily involved in charity you you're involved in bringing sports across the world and awareness and all sorts of really interesting things i remember i think i don't remember which olympics it was but i remember 
your name, and I remember seeing you in action back yeah. at like in the seventies, right? Were you in, in the, the 80s, Summer Olympics? Eighty four. Yeah. Yeah, Where in was Los that? Angeles. L.A. Right. Yeah. That's why. That was Most the only Summer that. Olympics I've ever yeah. watched. Yeah. How weird is that? Because exactly. it was right up the road for me. Exactly. So a lot of people remember that. LA yeah. Olympics so what was there. your sport? I did the triple jump. Triple jump. Yeah. Right. So the triple jump is like a long jump. You land and eventually you land in sand, but before you get there, you take three jumps. So hop, skip, and a jump. <laughs> That's what it is. It almost sounds funny to me now. Yeah. Hop, skip, and a jump. That's what they call so it. So you basically get to play. And that's all I've done in my whole life is I've played. I've loved what I've done in track and field. I love what I've done in business. And it's all been kids play. It's been enjoying. So you mentioned your dad and your family. Tell us, let's take us back to the beginning. Like, where'd you grow up and how, how did you really get into sports? And how did, that, how did, that, how did you become an Olympian? Let's, let's start there. Okay. Because not, there's not many people who claim, can claim to be Olympians. That's yet. true. Only 120,000 of us. That's amazing. In the world. In the world. Exactly. Out of seven and a half billion people. Exactly. Huh. So, cool. so I was actually born in Fairfield, California, near, you know, on the, on the mil- uh, Air Force Base, Travis Air Force Travis, Base. Travis, yeah, I've been there many times. So my father was in Billiton, so he had all the guys flying out. And then we went to uh, Southern California. I lived in Camp Pendleton, on Camp Pendleton. Okay. And uh, Oceanside. Yep. So I graduated from Oceanside That's why I High live School. in Carl, or my office in Carlsbad. I live in Encinitas right now. Get out of Dodge. Yeah. We're neighbors. I live in Carlsbad. Are you serious? I live in Carlsbad right next to La Costa Canyon High School. Are you kidding I me? I know where La I drive by it all the time. Every day, our, right? Our, so we got to come down and visit us. Our, our, we, we have I this will. little tiny office now with a little functional gym, which is, you know where In N Out Burger is? Of course, right down there. <laughs> right across the street yeah. from that. Yeah. 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 On Avenida Encitas. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> we Neighbor, to, get out of that's here. That's our beach there. Oh, it's wonderful. Where we there. bring yeah. people to experience the ocean and the That's cold cool. at night and whatnot and then we do our seal fit events up in um, vale lake in temecula oh cool there's 400 acres yeah. they let us use it because we're really respectful of the environment yeah. Yeah, yeah. we always leave our campground cleaner than we found it Fantastic. and because our events are t- generally smaller than like say tough mud right 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 you know, we like maybe have 50 people that's awesome. That's cool. We're, yeah. we're neighbors. We're going to get together. We will. That's cool. So, so I started out, you know, as a high jumper, and, and I learned very early on that if you, if you just, just enjoy and focus, you're going you're gonna to do better. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and I also learned that you got to listen to people. Mm-hmm. So when I became a triple jumper, it was my junior year in high school. But you, I was, you didn't start triple. I didn't until start junior. until my junior year. But don't, in high school. You know, I was on track and field. It seemed like there's a lot of like you just try everything. The you coaches, do. hey Willie, I need you over here because And that is exactly what happened. <laughs> hey, they had never had the triple jump in high school in California until my junior year. And the coach said, Hey, I want you to try this and I tried it and I was good. And then Did you hop, skip and jump a lot when you were a kid? <laughs> I yeah. jumped a lot. I just jumped, just jumped, jumped. Jump, right? I jumped so much that my parents thought there was something wrong with me. Seriously. Really? Took me to a psychologist. <laughs> said, what is wrong with this guy? And he said, well, there's nothing wrong. He just likes to he jump. Would have, yeah, he just, he's just, act, just get him involved in activities and he'll calm down. Oh, that reminds me of my grandson. I actually right? have a grandson through my, my oldest stepdaughter. And yeah. this kid will not stay put. Like exactly. he's eight years old and he's like, all over the place. You remember Wilder at the, the old training center? He's like monkeying up, the, you know, he climbs the rope. 20 foot, he's up there. Hey, look at me, Pops. Exactly. And he's climbing all over the monkey gyms and the pull-up bars. And everyone's like, oh, my God, he's going to fall. And I'm like, no. you don't know this kid. No, this kid. <laughs> that's, that's, that was what it was all about. So, fortunately, he's so instead of saying. When you say saying, jump, I imagine like going up and down, up and down. Before no, we, I would were jump. jumping on things and I would things. jump up on top of my, the couch and then on top of the, the, um, Chester drawer. I would jump out off of the roof. Have you ever? <laughs> I did. I jumped Sounds off like roofs. Sounds like parkour. It was like parkour, like but early, only have I you did ever it done because a vertical, it was What's your max vertical jump? Oh you ever gosh, tested that? I was like forty-two, maybe oh, forty-six. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you just loved to jump. I loved it. It was the only thing I wanted to do. Fascinating. And I would get hurt, but who cared? You know, just keep on going. That was my motto. Just keep going. Did you like to run too, or were you a runner? Not so much. <laughs> yeah, that's painful. Right? Yeah. So, so when track started, they were always looking for somebody to run. Do the I was like, I'll be over here laying in the high jump pit. You guys go ahead and take care of that. But it, no, I was not a, much of a runner. But I had to run in the long and the triple jump. So that's when I practiced the running. 
Right. Well, that's mm-hmm. a short little distance, right? That's right. So when I come here to the Spartan and I see what you do on Seal Fit, I don't. I can't even imagine doing that mm-hmm. with my body type and with my 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 mindset. I can't imagine doing it. So I am so impressed by what I see here. In, for people who you just know, go Spartan. the long haul and they just can, suck I mean, it when up, someone yeah. tells cool. me, you know, oh, yeah, I'm going on a 100-mile run, I barely can make a 100-mile drive in a car. <laughs> I get so tired. Interesting. So it's amazing. Just it's amazing. So, so you mental toughness and focus and, you know, success with your body, mind, system can show up in many different forms. It you can. know what I mean? Well, it you know, doesn't have to. We were just talking to... Um, a guy who climbed Everest, you know, one step at a time. Uh, Crazy. I've been up Mount. Uh, I've been up Mount Whitney. Yeah. And the last maybe 400 meters, I was ready to turn around. I didn't think I was making. It, it was an inch, 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 inch. Right. That's about it. Interesting. So it is. It is not easy. I don't have the mindset that you all have. But I know how but you, powerful but the you've mind got a different is. Mindset that's I know how powerful, powerful the mind. I could probably do it, but and that's only because I know what the mind can do. And I've used. But you that have the mindset to become time. an Olympian, so you're being. Well, you know, your humility say, is. Kind of let's say there. there's two parts to the mind. There's the mind. There's your conscious mind, your subconscious, right? Yes. And you have to control the conscious mind. You don't have to worry about the subconscious mind. My problem was. I geared my mind, the subconscious mind, to quick hurt. Uh-huh. And you have geared your mind to the long hurt. Interesting. And I'm not there. Interesting. I could, if I had to, Yeah, for sure. because I can slug it out, because I've walked up that hill. I've, I've walked across Whitney. I mean, I'm sorry. I've walked across the Sierra Nevadas when I was a young kid. Mm-hmm. That's what we did. We, we just hiked mm-hmm. that, you know, in Boy Scouts. Yeah. I'm an Eagle yeah. Scout. And nice. so we learned how to hike. Right. And I just hiked. And I learned how to use that mental toughness that you have. But then as an athlete, doing the triple jump, the long jump, the high jump, it's all it's quick. It's quick, explosive. fast twitch muscles. Yeah. yeah, and I didn't have to do right. a lot of, right. of, of long, drawn-out pain control. What was the hardest thing for you about that sport? Uh, getting through the pain, yeah. It's, okay. it's just as painful. When you, so, for instance, I have part to jump is the off sprint the sprint or the the painful part is the jump in the, the triple jump, jump. Really? yeah. Because you're gonna come down, you're gonna land, and it's 20 feet. I jump 20 feet. I land on my right leg and keep going. It's like jumping off of a roof, okay, and landing on one leg. And you that's break a how, bone or twist you, ankles. I've done that? it all. Oh, huh. Broken ankles, broken feet. Broken. I don't have sesamoids anymore. You know, it's, I don't it's crazy. I don't know what a sesamoid is, yeah. but the fact that you don't have them <laughs> the is impressive. The ball of your foot is all ripped up. It's like <laughs> crazy. I will not take my shoes off. <laughs> so it's it's just a, your mind can do some crazy things. For sure, yeah. I remember this one time. I was in uh, I was at UCLA, and we had a big dual meet against uh, our arch enemy, USC. Mm-hmm. And I was a freshman. And we had, on both teams, we had Olympians. We had uh, world champions. We had some of the greatest athletes in the world on either side of the team. And I was just a freshman joining this team. And uh, I'll never forget the night before, I went to... I, I went out with my girlfriend, came back, and I told her, I said, I think I'm going to win this. And she's like, you're a freshman, idiot. <laughs> and I said, no, no, I feel pretty good. So I went to bed. I, I laid on my bed, and I was just thinking. And it's like I woke up. It's like I woke up, and I, I guess I had been going through this dream for like an hour, and I didn't even realize it. And I was but, soaked wait, with the, sweat. The dream was you telling your girlfriend you're going to no, win? or I, I'm uh, sorry. The dream was me going through the competition. I see. You were in on. In my, my head. Right. And I woke up, and I was drenched with sweat, and I went to sleep. The next day I got up, and I wanted to do what I did in the dream. Right. Went down there. I beat the Olympic champion in the long jump, Holy and God. I bet, beat the two-time uh, NC2A champion in the triple jump, and I won the meet on my last jump. I jumped a national record, 55-1, and it was all because I went through that process the night before. Which you didn't intentionally do. Nope. It wasn't like you were going through a structured visualization. You, no, you, it wasn't at all. Wild. I didn't even know what visualization was until later on when they explained the visualization. I said, I think I did that my <laughs> freshman year. <laughs> That's and wild. that's it's it's amazing. So then Isn't I started studying the brain, and I realized that the conscious mind can do four things 
at one time. Right. The subconscious mind can do 40 million, 4 million things at one time. Uh -huh. And I realized that that's a whole nother way of training. A whole nother level, yeah, I agree. And a whole nother way of being. If you understand that concept, so you train to let your conscious mind understand what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Once the conscious mind gets it, it does it perfectly every time. Right. That's why an athlete trains and then goes out and performs. Because once you're in performance mode, you don't think about That's it. That's right. You just do. You just do. Yeah. That's fascinating. It's it's really I'm like you got me like doing some mind mashing on how that could have happened. Like you must have had you must have had a very visual mind where you thought a lot with imagery about the events so without knowing it you were probably visualizing it and then when you laid down the movie started playing of the performance right without you activating it it just kind of started playing in a, and when you went to sleep you weren't probably completely asleep it's more like a lucid it dream. Was a dream it's a lucid dream that it's you were, what some people call daydreaming yeah and every one of us does it, but we use it wrong. Yeah, right. If we you, just let it go randomly. And yeah, we random. Fantasy. Yeah. So what, what people don't understand, and what I realized three, four years ago when I started teaching girls softball. I'm not a softball coach, uh -huh. but I noted that girls dream a lot. They, they sit there and they kind of go off into this yeah, little in some thing, fantasy. and they're, they're thinking in their head. They're just running a mile a minute, right, just right. a mile a minute. And I realized I could use that. So I would take the girls, the, especially the ones that really couldn't focus. I'd take them, and I'd say, let's try this little game here. Let's try this little game. And they'd be like, oh, well, you know, going crazy, you know, and I'd go, okay, come on. And then I'd focus them, right. and I would drop something right in front of them, and they would try and catch it. Mm -hmm. And I would drop it, and they, they couldn't catch it. And then I would start talking to them, and I'd say, so what is your boyfriend doing today? And I would drop it, and they would catch mm -hmm. it. That's cool. Because they stopped thinking about it. Yeah. And they let their body do it. And do you know that team went from the last in the league to the eighth best team in the state and the 32nd best team in the nation from last to one of the best. That's cool. It's because they focused. They learned. We right. would stand in a circle and we would drop something in front of each other just around the circle. And that thing would not drop to the ground. The pen would not drop to the mm -hmm. ground because they were all so focused. That but they they're were not focusing hitting. on the pen. Are they, they weren't focusing on the pen. Mm -hmm. They you were know, that letting their body of do this it. drill that my Tai Chi instructor, Will Potter, used to do with me. I'm trying to see if I can get this right. So he would hold a quarter up, and I would have my hand about a foot beneath it. Right. And then he would drop the quarter. Right. And I have to catch, catch it. it. Right. It's very hard to do if you're thinking. If you're thinking. Right. Like you can. If you, and it's, very, it's impossible to do if you're looking at the quarter. Exactly. And so what you learn to do is just like really soften your gaze and just exactly. start breathing. So you focus on your breath. He drops exactly. the quarter, and you just go pop. Whoop. Because you let, your, you let your brain shut down, right. and you let the conscious your subconscious take over. That's right. It's like blinking. You don't have to tell your body to blink. It does it automatically. Yeah. You don't have to tell your body to lift your lip. It does it when you smile. It, the brain is an amazing thing. Yeah, it's incredible. And we stop it from doing what it can do yeah, perfectly. We get in our own way. So we can come back to that. That's so interesting to me. But um, a little bit more about becoming an Olympian. Okay, so... Part of that, imagine, so you're on this team with all these Olympians. It's super inspiring. Yep. You obviously had a lot of natural talent, mm -hmm. right? Or else you wouldn't have beat these people and set national records. Yep. But that's only part of it, isn't it? It's like it's yeah. just a, it's even. I mean, obviously those things have to happen. Inspiration, great coaching, mm -hmm. raw talent. Mm -hmm. But you were a freshman, and then you had to go do it again as a sophomore, as a junior, as a senior. That's right. Bump, 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 in many, many years until you – perform in the Olympics in 1984. Yeah. Would you say the hardest part is just showing up every day then? What, what is the hardest part for you? The first step. The first step. always the hardest. The first step. The actual standing there and deciding, okay, today I'm going to do something that no one else in the world has ever done. Hmm. 
and making that first step because the first step is the hardest. Do you right? say that every day if you want? Every to be day I there? walk out there, and I used to train. Does that mean really I'm going to do the best I can? I'm going to do better than I did yesterday. I mean, how does that practically every show up? Every day I wanted to go out there and do. If I wasn't going to do one thing better, I was going to do something better. Something better. Better than I'd ever done before. Better than anyone else has ever done before. And you have to have that mindset in order to improve. What if you run out of things to improve? You never run out of things to improve. It's impossible to run out of things because there's so many things involved in what we so do. So give us an example of how that played out for you. So for instance, when we warm up, when we warm up, we, did a, we didn't do static warm-ups. Mm -hmm. we, would do, we would go around the track uh, two times and we would do different exercises, mm -hmm. skipping, jumping, mm -hmm. lunging, all kinds of different exercises. And I was training with who is currently the world record holder in the long jump. His name is Mike Powell. And Mike and I would go together and we would start training and we would start out. I was so out of breath, so tired after the warm-up. Warm <laughs> so because the, we your warm-up was other people's workout. Exactly. That's what we used to it say was. Press, and we yeah. had, I had to come to practice with a certain mindset. If I came just like blah, 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 blah yeah. I would be destroyed by Mike. And so just I, in the warm-up. In the warm-up. <laughs> and so every day it was like, okay, we're getting to practice. Take that first step. Boom. And we went. And it was just an hour to three hours of hard training. Mm -hmm. I loved it. It was the best time of my life. Mm -hmm. That's cool. And just to do that every day. Every day. Show up every day. Just Show to prove up. something. Make that first step. And it's the same. I mean, I, every time I go to the office, it's the same thing. I'm sure it's the same thing yeah. with you. When you take that first step in the office, you don't just walk in. You know, you take that. No, it's, it's like, like a switch, prep, switch you on. <laughs> switch on. Right. Because I know you are a motivator. And if you walk in unmotivated, you've destroyed the whole group that yeah, you're with, right? It's true. You have to switch on. And the same with me. When I walk in my office, I can't walk in with a bad attitude mm -hmm. or else the whole atmosphere changes. So you mm -hmm. have to switch on, yeah. be ready for everybody and every, everything that comes your yeah, way. Yeah. Everybody needs to do that frankly everyone on the team that's that's one of the key tenets you just hit on for for me because one of the things i do is that i'm expert at is building elite teams because of my seal team experience but through seal fit it's all about the team and the team will drop to the level of the lowest common denominator okay. and that's energy and attitude exactly right exactly. rarely is it all it rarely is it showing up in performance that should, that's a lag indicator that's correct energy and attitude and that's so correct. everyone needs to show up at, as their best self every day and teams can train to do that, right? So the great teams, the winning teams that produce the most records and the most you know, winning athletes and most Olympians because the team naturally holds everyone to that standard, right? Exactly, and that's why it amazes me when people are amazed at how well the United States does uh, in, the, in Olympic competition. We hold the most medals, we have the, the, the most records, and and they go, well, why? Because you know, the, the mindset pervades all those sports. Exactly. Everyone has when, to step up. When you bring in a, a, a team, and that team is the best in the world, everybody around them is going to feel the best in the that. world. Right. They're going to feel it. They held, here in Squaw Valley in 1968, they held a training uh, th this was their training camp for Mexico City. They knew they were going to Mexico City in altitude. So they held the training here in Squaw Valley. And I talked to all these guys. In fact, I'm going to be the master of ceremonies of the 50th anniversary of the 1968 Olympic team. No kidding. How cool and is that? What fun. One of the things they talk about is being able to be here and train together and watch each other. And do you know the United States broke, I think it was like eight, eight, World records, they brought home, uh, I think it was 25 medals. It was an amazing team. It was the best Olympic team that the United States had ever assembled. Really? Yeah. 1968. 1968. Holy it's cow. It's amazing. That is pretty amazing. And it's just because they, they got all these champions together, all these uh, alphas, and let them go. Right. That's fascinating. So what? So after your Olympics, mm -hmm. you clearly stayed involved in this sport. How did that happen, and, and what does that look like? Well, there's 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 a reason for that. Mm -hmm. One reason that people get involved in anything is they feel a, a, either a kinship to it, 
or they feel like they've been ripped off somehow. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like I was ripped off somehow. Really? I was one of those. Uh, and the reason why is because in 1980, I was the best triple jumper in the world. Mm -hmm. I had beaten everyone. And uh, because we went, because uh, the Russians went into 80 Afghanistan. Was, we canceled it. We Reagan, boycotted. Reagan boycotted. No, I remember. it was Jimmy Carter. Oh, Carter. Boycotted. And I was furious. Because you didn't get to go to. I didn't get to go. Did and they, so did that's they how I got involved in politics of sports. Interesting. So you competed in 84, though. That, I made the 80 team. Did you win in 84? Competed in 84. Did you win a medal? Nope. No? No. But you would have, you think, in 80. 80, definitely. Okay, yeah. Okay, so you felt ripped off. And yes. you wanted to make sure that didn't happen to other athletes. To other athletes. So I got involved, and I've been involved ever since because I know. I mean, people say politics shouldn't be involved in sports and vice versa. And I, I'm fully with that, right? Yeah. What do you think? This is a, a huge leap from that, but what do you think about banning the Russians for doping? Yeah, see, I think that's a that little bit different. Is that politics or is that? No, I don't think that's politics. I think that everyone knows that you have to play by the rules. I see. And yeah, I that's a little bit different. Their politicians didn't stop them. Mm -hmm. It was their, it was the fact that they actually tried to cheat. They cheated. And that's yeah. cheating. So sport is, is just a game that has rules, right? Right. It's an activity that has rules. And if you break the rules, you're no longer playing the game. Right. And that's how athletes in, in our sport feel. If, if someone's cheating by using drugs or performance enhancing, whatever it is, we feel cheated. And so we don't want those people to participate because they, they've taken our sport and turned it into something else. I'm trying to go back in my mind. So I was at the 1980 Winter Olympics. So the Summer Olympics happened before that. Jimmy Carter was just was No, no, no. The lame Winter duck. Olympics happened before, so they were able to go. And the summer happened later. But so, wasn't Reagan elected in 1980? He, yeah. No, he was elected in 1980. Yeah, he was, let's see. He was elected in 1980 because, and, and Jimmy Carter, um, remember, he, he had the Iran crisis. He right. had I'll all say, these so, problems. So, so he was elected, but he didn't, he didn't come, come into, up. Reagan didn't come into office until January of of 81. 81. Oh, I see. Yeah, so you were caught up in that, yeah. It was crazy. Why did he allow the Winter Olympics to go on? Oh, it's because Winter Olympics were in Lake Placid, Summer Olympics were and now it's coming together for me. I'm a little slow up <laughs> on the okay. uptake sometimes. That's okay. <laughs> no, it's a little bit vague, and, and, and it seems to be losing its historical But it's so crazy because, I mean, here we are. We beat the Russians on the ice. Yep. And then six months later, he wouldn't even let... The U.S. Team, the team go, go to go. Afghanistan? Yeah, that's weakness. That is weakness. Oh, whatever. So what impact do you think you've had on the Olympic sport and the role post-Olympian you know, post in your role as, a, as an advisor slash you know, mentor slash whatever you would call it, your various roles have been? Well, let me put it to you this way. Consultant. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let Leader. me put it to you this way. Um, in 1980, after the boycott and everything, um, a group of us got together and we decided no more. We're not going to put up with this anymore. We're no longer, there's no longer going to be this thing called amateurism. It's a farce. When people can lose their abilities to, to, um, to become financially stable by a politician just saying we can't, we're not going to the Olympic Games. So we got together and we created a... Um, a way for athletes to make money through what is called a trust fund system. Really? Your money went into this trust fund and then you can do it. And eventually that all broke up and now we've got pros competing in everything. So I would say that that is one legacy that I would like to say is partly mine. And if you, and um, the former executive director or CEO That was back, of by the way, when you couldn't be pro and an Olympian. That's Olympia. correct. And when, did they, when and why did they change that ruling? That changed that. They changed, we changed it in, seven, in 1980, 81. Right around the same time. Yeah. Because after that boycott, well, we were Well, everyone done. else was sending pro athletes well, right, to the Olympics. Well, except it all for depends United on how you def define pro. They were sending military people. Yeah. So well, people on the sitting, payroll. Yeah, yeah, people on the payroll, right? <laughs> but they say, well, they're not competing for money. They were training. I mean, they were getting paid for training. So right. what's the difference? Right. So, so yeah, we, we I felt like a pro out. athlete as a Navy SEAL, by the way. You did? Uh, I'm sure, yeah. Getting paid to train getting every day. Getting paid to train. That's some the fun stuff, thing. wasn't it? Great stuff. Yeah. yeah, I love it. So, so I, I'd like to claim that. 
And the other thing I'd like to claim is, is I think I brought a little bit more um, athlete managed sport. So, so I helped to I helped to push the the idea of an athletes committee, mm-hmm. which would be part of the decision making of issues in uh, well track and field. Maybe because there was too much separation between the decision makers and the actual and the athletes. Yeah, yeah that makes and sense. we needed to bring that closer together. Interesting. And then the United States passed a, a law actually in '78 giving the athletes at least a 20 percent representation on all decision making bodies. So we took that and we just shoved it down their throats and mm-hmm. said. From now on, we're taking our 20% at least, and I just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. Mm-hmm. That's fascinating. You know, it reminds me, I worked um, with the U.S. Women's Velodome team that won a silver medal in the 2012 cool. Olympics. And what you're talking about is a big issue with them because they had this big kind of disconnect. They didn't have any funding compared to their the Brits and the other people who were like dominating the sport. Right. And then they had um, the coaching staff was basically just spoon feeding in their training plan. And, right. uh, and they're like, yeah, this isn't working for us. And they weren't getting the feedback, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and there's a huge disconnect. Right. And I imagine that happens with probably different degrees in different sports, depending upon, you know, how well the coaching staff integrates with the athletes absolutely and so one of the biggest things we did probably the most formative thing is we we elected the team captain because they didn't have their four-person team just them the four of them Mm -hmm. the entire sport Mm -hmm. and then we had them have a like a come to jesus meeting with the coaching staff and say listen we want input on our training plan because we actually know what we need how about that Right. Uh-huh. And they said, okay. And they started to change the training and, you know, mold it to their conditions and to start doing a lot of the, the, the tracking, you know, kind of the optimized self type stuff. Yeah. And, um, and they started just all their time just kept ticking up, ticking up, ticking up. And then that's great. They nailed it. Won a silver medal. That's, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's One really simple cool. shift. That's really true. You know, that's, that's a awesome. I love that. So ultimately Coaches don't all have all the answers, right? The athletes have a lot of the answers inside themselves, but they need to be held accountable, and they need the expertise of the coach, but sometimes exactly. you need to let them do what they do best, right? I, I'm 100% behind that idea. That's cool. So what do you do now? Like, What's, the, what's your main uh, focus these days? So right now I'm the CEO and president of the ANOC World Beach Games. It's the Association of National Olympic Committees. They're having their very first World Beach Games down in San Diego. Okay. In uh, October 9th through the 14th of 2019. World Beach Games. What type of sports do we get to do? We're going to have surfing, and kite surfing, skateboarding, beach soccer, beach handball, beach tennis. Nice. Yeah. We're going to have 17 events. Beach tennis. Yeah. Beach tennis is an awesome sport. You got to check it out. I've never seen a tennis ball bounce on sand. Well, it's, it doesn't bounce on sand. It's just <laughs> over and you just play it. It's kind of like badminton, but only with a, like a tennis ball. Oh, cool. Yeah. Interesting. It's, it's very quick. It's very fun. And you'll see some great athletes uh, playing it. Uh, so so we have that. And then we have uh, we're, we're about in San Diego, ski jump. Right? It's going to be Mission, Mission Beach. Mission Beach, yeah. Sure. Yeah. It's, it's a wonderful awesome. place. So we're yeah, really well, we should that. synchronize on that. I'd love to come help you out, or you that know, would be awesome. Do something down, be there. down there. Yeah, yeah, that'd be cool because that's you know, you're, you're my neighbor grounds. after all. I know we're neighbors. <laughs> come on. And Carpool. so what, the ski jump is not happening on the beach. That's something different. No, that's going to be in the bay, right okay. behind the beach. Like water ski jump. Bay. Yeah, water yeah, ski I jump. Yeah, I used to water ski competitively really? way back when, upstate oh, New York man. when I was a kid. Slalom. I never yeah. went off the ski jump though. That looked a little too. Have you done wakeboard? I have not tried waking, wakeboarding yet, no. Yeah, the wake, we're going to have wakeboard, but... Yeah. Yeah. No, it's one of those things. I, I, I'm just a creature of habit when I get behind a boat, and I love solemn skiing. <laughs> cool. And we have a course up in Lake Placid. We have a, my family has a summer house in Lake Placid, New York. Awesome. And that's another Olympic place, huh? It is, yeah. Oh, Olympics. that's cool. Fantastic. You uh, live in Japan? I lived in Japan for three years. But not yeah. anymore? No. Not anymore. I okay. moved uh, back. I moved back, and we moved to Atlanta. I did the Atlanta Olympic Games. And then from Atlanta, I moved to San Diego, you know, to Carlsbad. Uh-huh. And I've been in Carlsbad ever since. You think you're going to stay there? Or? Oh, yeah. I, my wife won't let me move. 
uh, any further than 15 minutes away from the Jazzercise headquarters because she's a fanatic. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, so I don't know what to do. But, you know, she's like me. We love to dance, and we, you know, dance fitness is a thing. Right on. Yeah, yeah, so I do a lot of Zumba, a lot of Jazzercise. Yeah, my wife is into Zumba and Jazzercise. Yeah. Oh, jeez, I, I could It reminds me when I was in college, I went to one aerobics class. I mean, Jazzercise, it was basically aerobics, yeah. like yeah. what it was in the 80s. Yeah. I, the... the <laughs> solo guy in a class of 45 women or young girls I should yeah. say because we're talking about yeah. freshman year of college yeah that's that was an awesome experience for a couple different reasons yeah. you know exactly the girls being number one number yeah. two was I look like the biggest fool ever and I never went back really I wish I had though oh, what a great exercise it is I just I loved it I fell in love with it I did the first one I was like like you I was a little bit kind of tough all these women around but there was all these women around <laughs> <laughs> right so I, I i got into it and now i'm i just i'll 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 pit myself against any of the women dancing out there anytime. <laughs> that's awesome yeah really? i'm good so um you got the summer the anac is that right yeah, the A-N-A-C? association of national olympic committees that's anco cool. anco Oh, I'm A-N-O-C. sorry, N-O-C. <laughs> what am I saying? Okay, the beach games next summer. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then um, what's next after that? Like, what are your so, big things to solve? Big the problems and that, challenges that, to solve? Well, I sit on the World Olympian Association uh, Executive Committee, and we are trying to, of course, attack this epidemic of, of obesity that yeah. we have in our children. So yeah. we have 120,000... Olympians alive and we are encouraging each one of them to do something in their community that will help kids to learn how to either you know to to, to eat right mm-hmm. or to exercise mm-hmm. or to do something that focuses oh, cool. more on on getting out in public rather mm-hmm. than sitting in their house and playing games or right. something like that so we're we we have a mission and we're pushing that mission hard uh, i i believe that we can have a a, a big effect yeah. On on this, the upcoming uh, generation of kids. Oh, it's critical. I mean, the, the trend is that fifty percent of our population is going to be obese. Yeah. In like twenty years, they say, or something. I don't know the exact. Maybe you do, but it's irrelevant. It's going in the wrong direction. Still, with all the information we have, it's amazing. Well, good for you. Thanks for doing that. And is there any place that people can learn more about that, or how, how do so people find out about some of the important? The things World Olympian Association would be Olympians dot org. You can Olympians. go on there, and you can find you know the Olympians. Um, we also, as far as the um, World Beach Games, you can look up uh, A W B G S D. A W B G S D. Yeah, Anoc World. Beach Games or A W B G, um, twenty nineteen at um, uh, dot org dot org yeah dot org. That's a mouthful, but we'll put it screen. we'll put it on the website. Yeah, put it on the website for me. And how does uh, how do folks find out more about you? Do you have a, a Facebook? Page oh yeah, or? I've got Facebook Willie Banks, um, Instagram Willie Banks. Uh, I have. Uh, let's see what else LinkedIn Willie mm-hmm. Banks yeah. everything's Willie Banks pretty much all the Willie Banks stuff yeah just look Willie Banks and you'll find me <laughs> just Google yeah. it yeah thank you yeah man it's been thank great you. to meet you yeah thanks so you much you too for, neighbor yeah I hope well, I, I see you over there getting together we'll, yeah we'll I'll race connect. you now that you got a bad foot <laughs> <laughs> uh oh don't challenge me yeah <laughs> I might break it again <laughs> <laughs> okay all thank right. you so much yeah thank you I really appreciate it that's it folks Willie Banks check him out um, I'm gonna try to get down to those beach games that sounds like fun yeah. It really does. And yeah. Mission, Bay, Mission Bay is an awesome place. Um, so, yeah, let's, let's help them get the word out on, on obesity with children, get them moving, get them eating properly. It, it sounds simple, but it's not easy. It's right? not easy. And these kids, they just need, to, they need some inspiration. So we can do our part here, and let's help Willie out in that cause. Thanks so much, like I said earlier, for your, uh, for your support here. Thanks for your support for the Burpees for Vets. Super appreciate it. And... Um, Well, till next time, stay focused, do the work every day, and be unbeatable. Hooyah, Divine out. Hey, this is Mark Divine. Thanks very much for watching the Unbeatable Mind podcast on YouTube. You can also find the podcast at iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, and unbeatablemind.com slash podcast. Be sure to check out the new episode released every week. 
Booyah.